morning. The one, Proverbs 19:17. The one who is gracious to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord and will and the Lord will repay him for his good deed. Today and for the next two weeks, we'll be taking up money for the thank offering. This is something we do every year at this time. Presbyterian women from all over the world take this time to raise money for this thank offering. This offering was originally started in the late 1800s by one woman who challenged each member of the church she attended to give one dollar over and above their normal contribution. This fund created the General Mission Fund for the Poor. Today, over $27 million have been raised to help over 1,600 mission projects, both locally and abroad. Just to give you an example of an, a local one for this year, a Presbyterian church in Banner Elk is funding an after-school child care program to help parents who otherwise couldn't afford it. For an example of a global project, the Synod of Alaska Northwest Presbytery is funding 3,200 students for their training to become teachers to help improve the literacy among Guatemalan population. I hope you'll consider giving to this offering. If you want to write a check, write it to the Presbyterian Bethesda Presbyterian Women and put in your memo line thank offering. If you want to give cash, make sure you put it in this blue envelope. Uh, some are in the North X and some are right here. Um, and you'll see them for the next couple of weeks. I'll have them. Or if you want to go online into your normal online contribution with the Bethesda website, you can do that. But I hope that you will prayerfully consider this. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome back Re uh, Reverend Misty Mowry again from last week. You remember her? She's, be with, she's with us today, and welcome. Um, the first, our announcements, one of the, uh, the first announcement is the Martha Circle has been changed from Tuesday evening this week till tomorrow evening. Uh, so it'll be on Zoom. So at 6.30 on Zoom, Martha Circle. Uh, the congregational meeting uh, Sunday, November 21st, will be November 21st to approve the election of the new officers. Uh, there will also be a joint meeting of the session and the deacons that meeting that day at 4. Uh, also, uh, the stewardship um, committee has sent out the pledge cards and time and talent cards. Uh, please fill these out either electronically and return them by uh, email, or you may bring a hard copy to the church. And there are hard, co hard copies available in the Narthex and in the office. Please have everything done by the November 21st, Commitment Sunday. Uh, right now, uh, Rick Noyes has a very, very important announcement from the choir. A uh, little over, I guess it's been longer than 10 years now, I was sitting where you are, and I was asked if I wanted to join the choir. And I was like, what? <laughs> uh, I have had no musical education and no formal uh, musical training that I'm sure is evident from time to time. But there was no audition necessary. And upon joining the choir, it has provided me an opportunity to contribute to this worship service it has provided me the opportunity to participate in some magnificent works of music and form a wonderful bond with this group of people over here. I was invited. I am inviting each, and one, each one of you to come join us on Wednesday nights at 7. Whether you think you can sing or not, uh, we'd like to see you in, in choir. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Ditto here. <laughs> 
Uh, it's time for the catechism question. Um, the one that we did this week was question eight. Would you please read that one with me? How doth God execute his decrees? Thank you. Well, we know that a de decree is an official order, an edict. It is something that is or seems to be foreordained. So let's read uh, the answer together. God executeth his decrees in the works of creation and providence. Um, before I forget it, I want to tell you that from the children's version of the catechism, question eight is, what are they? And that's referring to the Godhead. What are the members of the Godhead? And the answer to eight is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you. Um, God carries out what he has foreordained through the works of creation and through his benevolent guidance. He is the, he is the guiding power of the universe. Revelation 4.11, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Daniel 4.35, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The glory of God is his power, his wisdom, and his worthiness of honor and worship. And I'm going to leave you with a quotation from A.W. Tozer. A God less than sovereign could not bestow moral freedom upon his creatures. He would be afraid to do so. Amen. Keep your catechism handy.
Thank you, Erlene. That uh, is so appropriate for today for the beauty of the earth. This is one of the beautiful times of the year with the colors of the leaves and the chrysanthemums and all of the many, many shades of browns and golds. It's just a great time to see the beauty of the earth. It is good to be with you this morning. And let me state the obvious. This room is cold. <laughs> um, we'll just avoid all social distancing issues. And if you need to snuggle with the person next to you, you go right ahead. I'm just grateful that I thought to wear my robe today. Um, it's unusual for me to be able to supply preach two Sundays in a row. I did consider doing part one and part two, but as it turns out, the message that the Lord prompted me for this morning um, does follow from uh, last week in a way, in a way. Uh, but as you've noticed perhaps already from the title, it also seems to fit our circumstances. <laughs> Thermometer or thermostat. <laughs> Will you stand with me as we read the call to worship printed in the bulletin, Worshiping the Lord. When the world hates, when the world rejects the poor, we are called to love and repent. When the world does evil, we are called to do good. We will not be conformed to the world's pattern, but let us worship. Amen. And let us worship by singing together number 729, an old favorite from camp days. When we think about being like Jesus, 
we realize how far we fall short. Will you join with me in the prayer of confession as printed in the bulletin, followed by silence as we reflect upon our weeks? Let us pray. Caring God, you call us to be the body of Christ, to live in community, to care for one another, to use our different gifts. But instead of working to sustain community, we follow our own desires. Instead of trusting in your care, we think we can do it alone. Forgive our neglect of others. Give us obedient spirits that we may care for one another, depend on your love, and use our gifts for your gospel. And the people of God said, Amen. Scripture is very clear. There's no ambiguity. There's no reading between the lines. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us, rinse us, robe us in God's righteousness. This morning, we are a forgiven people. Hallelujah. Will you stand and share the peace of God one with another as you are led? That sounds perfect. Yes. So we'll, um, before the choir scene. Right. Right there. Got it. As we resume our seats, we carry the love of Christ with us. We do have one more announcement that needs to be taken care of today. Come on up so everyone can hear you. Good morning. Um, I was asked to uh, tell you that a genie would be coming out of a bottle in your home this week, and it's called the Genie Messenger. We are going to have Thanksgiving dinner served here at Bethesda, and it'll be a drive-through, but we're preparing for 300 to 350 
being served this year. We have 24 turkeys. We need at least 24 ovens. And um, on the messenger, Genie Messenger, you can respond to it or you can call uh, Janet, Brenda, Laura, or me. And um, we need sweet potatoes. We need all the trimmings. And we have the pans. You don't have to mess up anything at your house. But we just ask it to be cooked and warm that day. And um, the turkey, of course, can be maybe the day before. But uh, we would like a good response, and um, Janet Pill is heading this up for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, great. My son told me he didn't want turkey this year, so I know where to come. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to the offering that the choir has for us.
indeed. So, so good of a reminder. God's truth will march on. As we prepare to hear the word of the Lord, will you pray with me? God, we ask that you would open our eyes so that we could behold wonderful things from your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture today is Hunt and Peck. It's Romans 12, verse 2, and then dropping down to verse 9. Now you need to know that Paul wrote this letter to a church he'd never been to. A church he had never been to, but he knew a lot about because many of his friends were there, preaching and missionarying and discipling those who were new believers in Rome. Paul had heard about a lot of issues, theological issues, practical living issues, interaction, community issues. And so he wrote one of his longer letters to provide guidance. And this section we're going to read today is from near the end of that long letter. So he's already done the theology. He's already proved why Gentiles should be allowed in. He's already talked about many, many things dealing with the beliefs. And he's wrapping up directions for how to live, practical how to live guidance. Hear the word of the Lord. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to, re- to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And in verse 9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. This is the word of the Lord. So today I want to talk to you about thermometers and thermostats. When I was a little girl, there was only one kind of thermometer used at our house, and there were only two places to use it. (laughs) I was so glad when I got old enough to be able to gently hold a thermometer under my tongue instead of where the baby still had to have her temperature taken. And today, thermometers are everywhere. Not the glass tube with the mercury in it, No, 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 we've got ear thermometers and forehead strip thermometers and no-touch thermometers. You just aim it at somebody's head and it gives a temperature. A year ago when I was getting my cataract surgery done, I went to the hospital for my check-in and they said, stand over here and put your face in this circle. Just look at it. And sure enough, my temperature showed up. Who knew? But no matter which kind of thermometer you've got, it does the same thing. All of the thermometers do the same thing. They reflect the temperature. They respond to what they're measuring with a visual display, usually a number. Now the normal temperature for a human being in the United States, where we use the Fahrenheit, is 98.6. Although I did read an article six months ago that said they finally figured out that most of us don't run that high. We're more like 97.8. Nevertheless, we know what normal is. And on the old glass thermometers, 
Remember that tiny little red arrow? You had to twist the tube just right. As a matter of fact, I was trying to train my roommate who was taking her daughter's temperature because it was the only thermometer in the house, of course. And she said, I can't see it. And I said, you have to just hold it right, kind of tilt it this way. She never could find the temperature. She had to go out and buy a digital one. But anything above that little red arrow counted as a fever. And if it was below there, you could ignore it. And because of the symptoms of coronavirus, most of us have our temperature taken more than we ever have in our past. Even for just checkups, dental checkups, medical checkups, or driving someone else to the doctor. Again, when I was getting my surgery, my son drove me and they said, well, come and take your temperature. He said, I'm not having anything done. You're in this room. We need to know your temperature. Good grief. My first dentist appointment after quarantine, do you remember yours? The procedure was you arrive in the parking lot and you call the reception desk. Of course, they assumed we all had cell phones. So you call the reception desk and say, I'm here. And the receptionist came out. She would ask a few questions, check, check, check. And then she took the temperature with one of those little pointed at you things. My temperature was 103. Of course it was. I lived a mile and a half from the dentist office. It was a bright, hot day. The car was overheated, hadn't even started air conditioning yet. My body temperature reflected the temperature of the car, not the temperature of my body. She said I could get out and try again in a few minutes. Because thermometers reflect the temperature. Now, a thermostat is different. A thermostat does not reflect the temperature. Instead, it affects the temperature of whatever it's around. So, in modern 21st century fashion, I looked up thermostat online, and at the website called Explain That Stuff, this is what I found. What is a thermostat? You might have a temperature control on your wall in your home to control the heating system. And although it's probably marked in degrees, it's not a thermometer. It's called a thermostat, a modern word based on two ancient Greek ones, thermo, meaning heat, and status, which means standing. It's related to words like stasis and status quo and static. It means to stay the same. So we can tell from its name that a thermostat is something that keeps heat the same. When our home is too cold, the thermostat switches on the heating, so things quickly warm up. Once the temperature reaches the level we've set, the thermostat switches the heating off, so we don't boil. Let's just be clear about the difference, it said on the website. A thermometer is something that measures the temperature, a thermostat is something that tries to maintain the temperature. So, thermostats, we're surrounded by them. Basic necessity for most of us in our homes, our cars, our stores, our churches. And a thermostat's job is to affect the temperature. Now, in the summertime, my son and I, he's an adult, he lives with me, we have a friendly disagreement about where to set that thermostat. Because as I've aged and added certain medicines to my daily routine, I find my body doesn't keep a good steady internal temperature. And given a choice, my little apartment thermostat would be set at 77 degrees during the day. Now my son, who's a 40-something person, wants it kept more like 73 degrees during the day. And that's with the fan blowing. And at night, of course, I turn it down. I'd like it down to about, well, 73, but he'd rather it be turned down to more like 70 or less. We don't fight about it, though. I'm the mom, I win. <laughs> Actually, we did compromise. When he's home, I put on a sweater. When I'm gone, the house is cooler. What does this have to do with us as Christians? Well. Unfortunately, too many people are thermometers. No matter what's going on around them, that atmosphere around them, that's what they reflect. It might be a tense situation. 
or a scene full of anger. They pick up that vibe, right? And they respond to what's happening around them, sometimes even making the situation worse. In our current pandemic, thermometers reflect the latest news, the skepticism from the latest expert, the disappointment in the latest community leader. Thermos thermometers are up and down with the latest heat or cold around them. In the words of scripture, they conform to the pattern of this world. But God calls us to be thermostats. Instead of reflecting the situation around us, we're called to affect the situation around us. Maybe you know someone who's a thermostat, someone that they don't seem to get ruffled no matter what the situation is. Whether they have to stay home from the gym or work from the house or even wear a mask, it doesn't throw them. They seem to be able to carry this calm, this, this peace with them, no matter how bad things get. They're maintaining a temperature of Christ-likeness. And you know what? You feel better when you're around them for a little while. Oh well, yeah, how, how do they do that anyway? <laughs> well, the answer is also in scripture. They've been transformed by the renewing of their mind. You see, knowing that God is God helps bring peace. It says in Isaiah 26, 3, God, you will keep in perfect peace those whose mind is steadfast because they trust in you. So for those folks, their peace and joy is anchored in a sure hope. They're growing in the fruit of the Spirit. You remember the fruit of the Spirit? Patience, gentleness, goodness, oh yeah, self-control. Circumstances don't get them down because their hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, like the old song says. They're standing on Christ the solid rock, and the storms of life will not sweep them away. It doesn't mean storms don't come. Those folks have been through things, but they've come out the other side unshaken. And other people look to them as examples of faith, examples of steadfastness. Somehow they maintain that inner peace and that affects everyone around them. And you breathe a little deeper and your muscles in your neck relax just by being in their presence. They're kept in perfect peace because their mind is stayed on Christ. A thermostat Christian is described in our scripture today in those verses 9 through 12. This is how it reads from the message. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil, but hold on to dear, for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. You see, it does take work to be a thermostat. It's much, much easier to just be a thermometer, reflect what's going on around you, the people around you, whatever the situation is, just respond to that. You know, when a car has been outside in the sun all day, and you first get in and you crank it up, man, that thermostat has to really work hard to cool things back down. And that's what thermostats do, they work. They work. They know how to bring the temperature down, diffuse the situation, get things back to a state of peace. 
And uh, we know what happens when a thermostat isn't working. This morning, we can tell. We're called as Christians to be thermostats. We have to cling to Jesus. We need to be, well, Scripture said it, didn't it? We need to be transformed. Transformed by the renewing of our minds, day by day, often, moment by moment. Because you know what? The joy that we have it doesn't come from the world. The world around us doesn't have any joy, doesn't have any hope, doesn't have peace, doesn't have love. But when we're thermostat Christians, then this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. No, no, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Well, well, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Are you a thermostat today? This peace that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Well, well, this peace that I have, the world didn't give it to me. No, no, this peace that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Today, you be the thermostat. You set the temperature. Amen. Let's stand in response and sing together, Fairest Lord Jesus.
hopefully as you came in today, you were handed or picked up the elements for communion. If you don't open them yet, just hang on to them. Um, I'll tell you what to do, when to do. <clears throat> it's an amazing thing to me that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took a minute to teach his disciples something new. Knowing they were about to face one of the hardest moments of their lives, watching him die. And he wanted them to understand. But he knew that they needed a picture, an image, something they could cling to, especially in the days after he rose from the dead. Why should we remember his death? After all, he's alive now. But Jesus said no. No, it's important that you remember. And then his early disciples made it very clear to the churches, we still need to remember. And so from that time on, Christians have gathered at the Lord's table to remember. And all are invited. There was a time in the life of the Christian church that you had to have a token in order to stay. As a matter of fact, there is a time when you had to belong to that particular church. You had to be a property owner. You had to be a white male. You had to be, well, you know, the white stuff. Fortunately, the Christian churches went back to the Bible and realized, oh, that's all garbage. All are welcome. All are welcome. You could probably say it with me. For God loved the world so much, he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever, whosoever, an old-fashioned word, put your own name in there, so that whosoever believes would have everlasting life. None of you are old. None of us have hit middle age yet. What's half of eternity? But we gather to remember his death because that was the vehicle. That was the turning point. That was the change. That's what made Jesus different from any other human being. And so today, you are invited personally to come and to enjoy what God has provided at the table. Scripture tells us that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he blessed it. He said that very familiar Jewish blessing of thanksgiving over the bread. But then he broke it and he passed it to his disciples and that's where he put in the new part. This bread is my body broken, broken for you. Do this and remember my death. And then, after supper, he took the cup. And he poured it. And he said, this cup, this cup is the covenant, it's the promise, it's the agreement poured out in my blood. And it's for forgiveness. Forgiveness of your sins. Forgiveness. And when you do this, you remember my death. Keep doing this until I come again. Let us pray. Most holy God, we are in awe of the love that you poured out on the cross 
but also in this banquet. A taste of what is to come, a reminder, something tangible, something that involves our whole bodies and expresses the union that we have. God, we thank you for these elements. May they be reminders of your death, of your forgiveness, of your resurrection power, and of the power of the Holy Spirit within us from now on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll pull the top off of your containers and take the cup, the bread, this is the body of Christ. Do this in remembrance of them. And in the same way, the cup. Do this in remembrance of Jesus. I invite you to stand and join with me in the affirmation of faith. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. And let us be seated, and I encourage you to share cheerfully. There was one church that I heard about where the plates for the offering were kept up here, and one by one the ushers would call each row to dance down the aisle and deposit their offering. I didn't alert Erling to it earlier, so we're not going to do it that way today. But I do encourage you to give with a joyful heart.
devil. Out of the many blessings which you have showered us with, will you take this dibble dabble of our time, our talents, our treasures, and multiply it as you did the loaves and fishes? May thousands be reached for the kingdom of God. And not just with these resources, but with us, because we do bring you ourselves this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I always have to check the bulletin and make sure I can tell you that. Joys and concerns listed in the bulletin on your hearts. But I would be remiss on this special week not to also acknowledge the joy and concern for our veterans. Um, I, as you know, I'm an eighth grade teacher up in Sanford, and on Tuesday we'll be doing a lesson about veterans because unless your family has a veteran, you might not know what it means and certainly wouldn't understand the sacrifice. If you are a veteran of any of the services from any time or space, would you stand so that we can honor you? Thank you for your service. Thank you. Now, if you have a family member, a parent, a brother, an aunt, an uncle, a sister, a child, who is a veteran, will you also stand? We thank you for your surrendering and sharing of those veterans for our country. Thank you. I would like to I would like to spend an hour praying, but y'all would probably fire me and never ask me back. Um, because sometimes it's just that much. You know, you start chatting with God about people close to you, and then you think of people farther away, and then you think about the news that you just saw, and golly, Ned, an hour passes really quick. And you still haven't even mentioned all of your own aches and pains. But we won't do that this morning. What we will do, though, is to pray together because Scripture is very clear. When the righteous pray, things change. We're thermostats, folks. We're thermostats. And prayer is part of how we affect the situation. Now, I'm not talking about the big, giant miracles. I'm talking about the little, ordinary, everyday nudges. That's the way the Spirit of God speaks to me. I get a nudge, like, like somebody pokes me in the ribs. Hey, do this. Speak to that person. Give a smile. You know the person who works the deli? Strike up a conversation. Hey, that car that just cut you off, pray for the driver. That one's tricky. <laughs> Thermostats. Doesn't have to be big, just a nudge. The difference between your house at 70 and house at 71. You can tell. People around you can tell. Let's take these burdens to the Lord, casting our cares and walking away renewed and refreshed. Refreshed, let's pray. Lord, how good you are to say, come. Come when you're weary and heavy burdened. Come when you have anxiety up to the wazoo. Come when you're thirsty. Come in rejoicing. Come in celebration. Come in loneliness, come in despair, come. And so we do. Today, God, we come honestly, 
quietly, knowing that we don't even have to come up with the words because the Spirit of God within us often groans too deeply for words. But this morning, God, we felt a breath of your spirit. We felt a breath of your love, and we felt a taste of your peace. And we want that for those whom we love, for those whom we don't know. We want that for our veterans serving around the world and those who have come home with memories too horrific to even share. We want that for our missionaries who wonder if anyone is listening. We want that for our college students who feel so out of step with their classmates. We want that for our teachers, our students. We want that for ourselves, Lord. We want it to continue. We want to learn from you, God, how to be thermostats. Would you nudge us? Would you help us? Would you give us the power of the Holy Spirit to carry these ideas into the week? These seeds, may they grow. Because God, we want to be rooted and grounded in your love. We want to discover together how high, how deep, how wide the love of God is. And we want to be bold enough to speak the word in season. Oh God, we ask this in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As an expression of our unity, let us finally stand together for number 300. We are one in the spirit.
God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth give way and mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us, and the God of Jacob is our fortress. Go now in peace. Amen. Thank you.